right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. Lesson 10, Acts 10. Uh, you know, Kevin, what are we calling this thing? The Acts of what again? The Acts of the Apostle, Acts of the Church, Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Kevin, I've actually never heard anybody in my life say the Acts of the Church. That's a new one, Kevin. I like that. All of them say, and they all lead to one thing. We have one word, right? We have one word for each book of the Bible. This word is authority. So everything that Kevin just described, the church, the apostles, the Holy Spirit, all of those, when we function based on the authority that Jesus has given us, we can walk out the authority. I mean, think about Ananias, you guys. We just talked about this yesterday. He comes up to Saul, correct? He has to put his hands on a guy who's supposed to be killing. He's breathing threats, wants to murder people. And by authority and trust in the Holy Spirit, he walks out and one man is radically changed to the point where we're all changed. So strangely enough, when you think of Saul, you should always think of, of Ananias. So in Acts 9, you have what we consider the conversion of Saul. Now, up until this point, it's been all Jewish guys, right? It's all about these Jewish people that are experiencing Jesus Christ. But when you get into Acts 10, it's not how they've done it before. You're going to start seeing the gospel go to the Gentiles. I love asking this question. Rich, this one's for you. If you're not Jewish, what are you? Gentile. Yeah, so if you're Gentile, no, that doesn't work. Nope. Nope. The point is this, it's either either or. <laughs> You've got a Jew or a Gentile. So if the gospel has been going to uh, the Jewish people first, and now you're gonna start going to Acts 10, the gospel of the Gentiles, it's gonna rub somebody the wrong way. That's why, look, bottom line is when you get into Acts 15, you're getting into this thing called the Jerusalem Council. Acts 10 starts the hot button to the religious, even the religious believers. But like, dude, you can't go to the, the Gentiles. They, they don't look like us. They don't wear the same things. And they definitely don't eat the same thing. Acts 10 starts to, to, to really, I would say, stir uh, the Holy Spirit revival in that country. Isn't that the beautiful thing, though? Like, if you want to see a move of God, you probably should start asking the Lord to do it differently. I mean, let's just say specifically in America, if you live in America, we haven't seen a move of God in our lifetime nationally. We haven't. And I think it's a fair statement. Maybe we should start praying, Lord, how can we do it differently? Acts 10 is an incredible picture of what that looks like. And in fact, let's just jump into Acts, if you can, Kevin, Acts 10, verse 1. It says, there's a man in Caesarea named Cornelius. Okay, Cornelius is, look at this, he is a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. All right, so let's kind of just, I want to just give you a little bit of a backdrop. It's going to sound a little bit more historical, but just hang in there, okay? Cornelius is a Gentile, okay, Gentile, so he's not Jewish, just make sure everybody understands. He is a Gentile, okay? He is a family um, from God fears. So just because you're a Gentile, it doesn't mean that you don't, you, you don't believe in God. You can believe in God. And in this context, he's a God-fearing person. And as a centurion, he's in charge of a cohort, okay? A regiment of the Roman military. Now, there's, I want to walk through this. There's 10 cohorts, okay, of 600 men each, okay? Everybody get all that? There is one of, he's one of 60 officers, okay? Now you're gonna divide all of this. A centurion would be in charge of typically 100 guys, okay? It's a lot of math there, but the point is that this guy was a manager and a leader of a lot of soldiers, specifically even up to 100 to 600 people. It depends on who you're talking with and interacting with. Now watch this description. Now he's from Caesarea. Caesarea, Kevin, if you go to this map, Caesarea was about 30 miles north of, of Joppa. Joppa is going to be a really, really important city that we're going to talk about. So he lives 30 miles north. He's along the, Rich, what's this water over here? That would be the Mediterranean Sea. Yep. So it is a coastal city, a port city. Caesarea is right here. So 30 miles north. He's a military guy. Now watch this, of Caesarea. It's the capital of Judea under uh, the Romans. Okay, so there's a lot here, a lot of backdrop here. It's also, just to, to give you a really, 65 miles northwest uh, of Jerusalem. Okay, so this is the backdrop. So here he is. He is a part of the Italian regiment. And it says in verse 2, look, he was a devout man. He feared God along with his whole household. So his whole family feared God. Now, when, I, when we talk through this fearing God, I want to walk through this, okay? Uh, on the back of my page here, I just have a couple things here. God fears, we're, we're definitely Gentiles, who are interested in Judaism, 
but they were definitely not interested in one major thing. Circumcision. Look, man, I'm in. I'm in with this whole Judaism. I'm in with this whole like, you know, like uh, worshiping and, and fearing God. But you're going to ask me to get snipped. I'm out. Right. That's that's what they're talking about here. That's what this thing is coming down to. Am I right? And in fact, Acts, Acts 10 2, uh, Cornelius is described as he does many charitable deeds for the Jewish people. And this one will really mess with your theology. He prayed to God. He fears God. He gives things and he's praying all of this says there's a sign of like, I am in, except, in fact, this is even key. Cornelius is even willing, as even MacArthur says, to abandon their pagan religion in favor of worshiping the Jewish God. So like this guy, Kevin, does it not sound like Acts 8, Acts 9, Acts 10? It's all the same story. Just different names. Different names. The Ethiopian eunuch trying to read Isaiah. I don't understand this. Saul goes blind. Hey, I need somebody to go to pour into this guy so he can get baptized. Oh, by the way, Cornelius, he's praying to God, but he doesn't even know who he's praying to. Like every scenario. And can I just tell you this? God is literally setting up like, you know, a perfect golf ball on a tee. Like he's giving everything you need. You just got to take the swing. You just got to hit it. Like this is the process. But many of us are afraid about what the result's going to be like. Literally, Cornelius is going to have an encounter with God. He just needs somebody to introduce who he is. If the church would overcome the fear of man and walk these things out, people's lives would radically change. But yet what we think is, is, you know, Ananias. What if an Ananias said, hey, I, I, want, I want that blind guy to come to me. What if Philip in the Ethiopian, uh, in talking to the Ethiopian, you know, I, I don't really want to go to your chariot. Could, could you meet me over here? The same thing that you're going to get to, I'll kind of let the cat out of the bag again. Imagine if Peter didn't ever go to Cornelius' house. He said, you know, I'd rather have him come to my roof. And so as it continues on in Acts uh, 10, verse 3, about three in the afternoon, okay, scripture just says, he distinctly saw in a vision an angel of God who came in and said to Cornelius. So an angel shows up. We already know this. We've already proven this. Angels are real and so are demons. <laughs> says, looking intently at him, he became afraid. And he said, what is it, Lord? And the angel told him, your prayers and your acts have, of charity have come up as a memorial offering before God. It's a cool picture about like this incense, isn't it? Like as you pray, it, it's coming up before the Lord. And then in verse five, it says, here's what I want you to do. Can you go back to that map for me, Kevin? I want you to send men to Joppa. So about 30 miles, okay, from Caesarea. I need you to send 30 guys and I need you to call for a guy named Simon. Oh, by the way, he has another name named Peter. So in a vision, an angel shows up, right? He's not sleeping, he's awake, but an angel shows up. He says, send, how many guys, Kevin? Just men, right? For right now, we'll get into that detail. I need you to send men and I need you to go find a guy named Simon Peter. And in verse six, it says he's lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. OK, now what's kind of fun to me is and I just want to give you this this picture here of, of visions. God constantly is speaking through our team about visions. I'll give you an example. Paul, uh, when he was converted to Christianity, uh, many people, did Jesus show up in person or did he show up in a vision? Either way, he showed up. And I think about Ananias. Ananias, we know very clearly had a vision. OK, we know that Cornelius, here he has a vision. Paul, guess what? Same thing. He has a, he, in, in Macedonia in Acts 16, a vision about doing the missionary work in Macedonia. Paul again in Acts 18, he's assured of God's presence in Corinth through a vision. Paul again in Acts 23, promised God's presence during his trip to Rome. Like over and over and over, you see uh, God speaking through visions. And as a result, here's what's crazy. Cornelius is told, send guys to Joppa. And then it says in verse, uh, Kevin, if you go to verse seven, when the angel who spoke to him had gone, he called two of his household slaves and a devout soldier who was one of those who attended him. So Kevin, all right, he's being asked to do what? I need you to gather your slaves. I need you to gather a devout soldier. And where are they going again? They're going to Joppa. And Peter is a Gentile or a Jew? Peter is a Jew. Peter is a Jew. Cornelius is a Gentile. So here's what's interesting. A Gentile, right, is sending his servants to a Jewish house. Interesting enough, whose house is he at? The other Simon. The other Simon, a tanner. And tanners do what? Kevin, any thoughts on that? Uh, they, uh, my thought is like, they, 
take make leather basically. And they work with animals. Dead animals. Everything is being set weird. He's being asked to interact with a culture that he doesn't normally interact with. Simon Peter is living at a house that doesn't normally interact. Like he, he shouldn't even be there, you guys. So it says after verse eight, after explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. I love this that he doesn't question it. In verse nine, it says the next day as they were traveling and nearing the city, Peter went up to pray on the housetop about noon. So here we are. Where are we? We're in Joppa because we know he's with Simon the Tanner. So at noon, he's up there praying. So he's praying on the housetop. That doesn't sound weird. Like if you were to go on our roof today where I live in the Dallas area, people are like, dude, what's wrong with that guy? Why is, he on the, why is he on the roof of his house? Like back then in that culture, they had flat roofs. Usually he had ladders to walk up on there. In fact, Rich and I have even been in old city Jerusalem when you're up on a guy's roof and you're overlooking, you know, the Dome of the Rock, you're overlooking the Temple Mount. Like it's actually normal. So don't think this is a, a super weird environment. Peter's up there praying, okay? Uh, and it, interesting enough, in 2 Kings, you don't need to go there, Kevin. And in Jeremiah, people actually worship the Lord and false idols on rooftops. And so to be up on the roof and pray to the Lord is not unusual. And in verse 10, it says this, as Peter's up on the rooftop praying, it says he became hungry and he wanted to eat. But while they were preparing something, he went into a visionary state. And so this visionary state, just imagine if you're praying, he's totally wide awake on the roof and all of a sudden he just starts seeing something. That's, that's all it is. That's the environment. And I'm saying that I don't want it to be weird for us. Like if you're in communication with the Lord, the Lord can totally show up. And it says, this is what he saw. It says that he saw heaven opened and an object that resembled a large sheet coming down, being lowered by its four corners to the earth. Okay, so he's actually seeing this. And a sheet drops from heaven, four corners. And in verse 12, look what it is. In it were all four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and the birds of the sky. Now, Kevin, here's Peter up on the rooftop. Kevin, thank you for providing these very colorful animals. This is what Peter sees. Four-footed animals, reptiles of the earth. So he sees a snake, we've got a crocodile, we've got a camel, we've got uh, an ostrich, a horse, a pig or a warthog, a cougar or a tiger. I don't know what that is. Here's my point. A peacock. He sees all of this. And instantly, you guys, it goes against everything that Peter knows. Kevin, can you go to Leviticus 11, verse 25? Leviticus 11, verse 25 and 26, okay? There's a certain dietary action that you have to take place as a Jew, okay? We've already talked about the circumcision deal, but as far as eating things goes, in Leviticus 11, 25, it says, whoever carries any of their carcasses must wash his clothes and will be unclean until evening, verse 26. All animals that have hooves, but do not have a divided hoof and do not chew the cud are unclean for you. Whoever touches them, becomes unclean. So in this vision, in praying on noon, at noon on the housetop, on the rooftop, this is what he sees. Now, this is a classic Peter here. In verse 13, it says, Then a voice said to Peter, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, Peter said, I have never eaten anything common and ritually unclean. Are you kidding me? I'm not touching that peacock. I'm not touching that pig. But look at this. In verse 15, classic Peter form. A second time a voice said to him, What God has made clean, you must not call common. And just when Peter, maybe it says in verse 16, this happened three times and the object was taken up into heaven. I think every time Peter has an interaction with the Lord, it always takes him three times. Seriously. How many times did he deny Peter? Three times. How many times until he gets this whole vision thing? He argues with God three times. No, I'm not touching that thing. No, it's common. No, it's unclean. I'm not. Just shut up, Peter. Listen to me. Like, that's basically what the Lord says. And in verse 17, as he's trying to figure this thing out, it says he's deeply perplexed about what the vision he had seen. This is usually what happens. So I don't want to discredit visions. When people see visions, there's many times you don't actually know what they mean. Did I just see a sheet that just dropped down with a whole lot of pigs and peacocks? Somebody help me. But that's the beauty of how God works. He doesn't design this that you have to figure out all this on your own. That's why he's given us the body of Christ. Now think about this. Peter's completely perplexed about what the vision might mean. The men, what is happening now? Enter in, uh, you know, part of the story. If you go back to the map, it says the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked direction, so they're lost. 
And they got to ask, hey, do you have any idea where Sam, Simon the Tanner is or where the Simon Peter's living? They're asking directions to Simon's house and they're standing at the gate. So the exact time that it took these men to walk 30 miles, they show up at the door as Peter's trying to figure out what the heck did I just see? That's how God works. It's all about God's timing. But Peter did not discredit and say, gee, I had some bad pizza last night. Like, I, I can't. Surely that vision was not of God. But that's what we do in the conservative circles. You think it's so radical and so different and you think you're so, it's so charismatic. You're like, that can't be from God. But does anything of this actually contradict scripture? Well, in Peter's mind, it totally does, right? Because according to Leviticus, there's no way we can participate in this. But God decides to intervene and said, you know what? I'm changing things up. I'm going to alter a little bit about your perspective. And watch in verse 18, it says, they asked out, hey, asking if Simon, who is also named Peter, is there a guy named Simon Peter living here? And in verse 19, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, look at the Holy Spirit did. Three men are here looking for you. So now we know, right? We have two servants and one soldier. And these three guys came because Cornelius sent him. Three Gentiles are coming here to hang out with a Jew. And Peter's on the roof, you guys. He's not come down yet. And the Spirit says, three guys are down there. That's ridiculous. But God still speaks like that today. I believe that with all of my heart. The Holy Spirit still speaks to us today. What was Peter doing, you guys? He was praying. People have accused us multiple times. Stop praying that God would show you things so that you can go different places. From what I see in Acts 10, it totally happens. Peter's praying and God just showed up. It's always for his glory. In Acts 10, verse 20, if you'd continue on. So he says, get up, go downstairs, quit thinking about this and accompany them with no doubts at all. I love that line right there. Don't you dare question what I've told you. Don't you dare question what I've shown you. No doubts at all. No doubting Thomas says, just go. I've already sent them. And in verse 21, Peter went down to the man. He said, here I am. Like, not even a greeting. Like, hey, what's your name again? Hey, do you happen to be from, from Caesarea? No, he's like, hey, I, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason you're here? I love this because it's Ananias walking with confidence. He says, what's the reason? And in verse 22, they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and a God-fearing man who has a good reputation with the whole Jewish nation. It's a little sweet talking, right? Was divinely directed by a holy angel to call you to his house and to hear a message from you. So now this is the, this is the ridiculous part of the whole story. Three guys come and say, hey, you being a Jew, could you come to the house of a Gentile? You have a message that you need to share. In verse 23, Peter did something that he never would have done. He invited Gentiles into his house, into the house that he's staying, and he gave them lodging. And the next day, they got up and set out with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa went with him. So here's what's crazy. You'll find out later. He brings six guys. So now Peter brings six guys. Kevin, how many other guys came from Caesarea? Three. So three. So then you have those three, those six, plus Peter. You're looking at at least 10 guys maybe some tagalongs. And now they're going back to Joppa because this is way too good. This is way too good of a story that this cannot be anything but God. It says in verse 24, the following day he entered Caesarea and now Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives and close friends. How, how, does, how does Cornelius expect them? Like, how does he know? I'm not trying to be technological funny here. Like there's no phones, there's no emails. Like they're 30 miles away, you guys. Cornelius had ridiculous faith that God was going to move. He knew what he heard through the angel of the Lord. And it's just a matter of time. Can I just tell you this? When God has spoken to you, you can walk in such confidence that it's going to happen. In verse 25, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet and worshiped him. I'll get to that in a second. I wanna just go to this dark county story. It's crazy, we, we went to Greenville High School. Very rarely do I tell these stories, but I want you to understand something. We went to Greenville High School. We shared the gospel with an entire football team, public high school football team, and we were late. We were supposed to be there right at the end of practice at like eight o'clock. I, I, I remember this very vividly. And it was the coolest feeling, you guys. We ran onto the field 
and they were literally just waiting for us as we ran. Like it was like this hunger that they were just like, please come, please come, please come. Like dozens of kids came to know the Lord. And then that led to the baptisms, which you know, you guys, because of Dark County in Greenville, you know that led to multiple dozens and dozens and dozens of high school all throughout the state of Ohio saying, yes, come and share the gospel. And it started with the Cornelius type mentality, the football coach saying, please, please come. And he had everybody waiting. So when it says they fell down and they worshiped him, Peter just, he said, man, stand up, man. I'm just, I'm just a man. Don't, don't, don't bow down to me. Only God deserves our worship. In Acts 10, 27, it says this, while talking with him, he went on in and found that many had come together there. I mean, what an awesome, like, just confirmation. Like, I really did hear from the Holy Spirit. I really did see a vision. Like, I totally get it. These are a lot of unclean people. <laughs> like, right? This is what I saw. Like, that, that's kind of the mentality. But that's how God works. Just when you're beginning to question it, he sends three men. And then in this process, right, he's got his guys. He's got his six brethren, which Kevin, I think, uh, we went to was X 11, 12. Yeah. So here you have, just so you get this, this, said the spirit told me to accompany them with no doubts at all. These six brothers accompanied me. And so we went into the man's house. So you have six guys plus Peter walking into an quote unquote unclean environment. Why do we say that? Because the Jews do not interact with Gentiles for anything with their, in regards to, to worship. And Peter says this in verse 28. Peter said, you know, it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner. But God has shown me that I must not call any person common or unclean. In other words, you're not unclean anymore. Like that's the mentality. That's what he's saying. In fact, John MacArthur, I love what I love this little phrase. What Peter does is he breaks a taboo. He breaks the norm. Don't we need more Peters that are willing to break the taboos, that are willing to listen to the Spirit of God, function out a, a vision that you've heard and walk it out. And, and it might not look like anything you've done before in the church. That's what it's going to take in order to see radical change. And he says, that's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So I, I ask, why did you send for me? <laughs> all right, we're here. Let's put all the chips on the table. What, what is it? Why am I here? And Cornelius said four days ago at this hour. Like even those things to me are stamps of approval of the Lord. Four days ago at this hour and three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house. And just this, a man in dazzling robe stood before me. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. That means he's praying, by the way, and your acts of charity have been remembered in God's sight. Therefore, send somebody to Joppa, invite Simon here, who's named Peter. He's lodging in Simon, the tanner's house. Like Simon Peter needs to hear the other story, right? He needs to hear how the three guys showed up and said, hey, is Simon Peter here? Therefore, in verse 33, I immediately sent for you. I didn't process this. I didn't wait for it. I, I just, I did it. And you did the right thing in coming. So we're all present before God. All of us are here. We're ready, my family, my friends, to hear everything you've, com you've been commanded by the Lord. Wouldn't that be the easiest gospel presentation? And in verse 34, Peter began to proclaim the word. He didn't process it anymore. He actually, you ready for this? He didn't think, oh, I shouldn't be doing this because this isn't how we've done things before. He didn't think, I, I wonder what my Jewish friends are gonna say. He, he didn't go there. He knew the spirit of God had gotten to this point. And so he said, now I really understand that God doesn't show favoritism. You know what he means by that? It's not just for the Jews. In verse 35, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does righteousness is acceptable to him. And in verse 36, he sent the message to the Israelites. Wow. Proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. A amen. Jesus is the one who brings the peace and in verse 37, he says, you know the events that took place throughout Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Yeshua, how he anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. Peter, you guys, is reliving his life right now. He's just testifying as Acts 1.8 says, be a witness for me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the other parts of the end of the earth. Like, this is what I want you to do. And he's doing it. We ourselves are witnesses of everything he did. 
He did both in the Judean country and in Jerusalem. Yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. And God raised up this man on the third day and he permitted him to be seen, not by all people, but by us. Witnesses appointed beforehand by God who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Can I just tell you this? Peter was ready to deliver the message. Peter had a testimony. Aren't we all asked to do that? Aren't we all supposed to function as Peter's being led by the Spirit of God and to go and proclaim the message because Peter does this. He commanded us to preach to the people and to solemnly testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. And you guys, I love verse 43. All the prophets testified about him. Isn't that what we've been studying at Revive School, you guys? The Old Testament points to Yeshua, that points to the Messiah. It's a complete picture. That's why we're doing all these paintings. Every one of these pictures in the Old Testament and the New, they always point to him, that through his name, Everybody who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins. Please understand this. Right here, it just says who believes in him. There's no plus things. There's no added additions to read, to works, to do the baptism. He says, if you believe in him, you will be forgiven. And in verse 44, can I just say this? This is probably one of the most overlooked passages, honestly, in the New Testament. Is what you see is, is that we know in Acts 2, right? We had Pentecost. And the Pentecost came to who? To the Jewish people. Here you have the Gentile form of Pentecost. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. The Holy Spirit, you guys, the Holy Spirit fell. Fell on those family and friends because a, a praying, God-fearing person, a Gentile, an unclean, a common person said, I actually believe God wants to speak to us. Peter, out of obedience, walks it out and they encountered the Holy Spirit. I love what Wearsby says, there's a point of vindication right now. That there was a point of approval even within the Gentile community because they embraced the gospel. And it says in verse 45, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter, they were astounded. The six guys, they were astounded because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out onto the Gentiles also. Hey, I thought that, that Holy Spirit thing was supposed to be just for the Jewish people. No, 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 not according to that passage. For they heard them speaking in other languages and declaring the greatness of God. So can I just tell you, tongues broke out, even with the Gentiles. And in verse 47, Peter said, can anyone withhold water and prevent these people from being baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Kevin, it's Acts 8, it's Acts 9, it's Acts 10 again. They embrace the living God, they encounter the Holy Spirit, and then they get baptized. The whole Gentile family of Cornelius and Caesarea and all of his closest friends, Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then they asked them to stay for a few days. What an awesome story. And all of this, you guys, can I just say, it, it comes down to breaking the norm. Cornelius broke the norm, Peter broke the norm, and then even the three servants and then the six, they all did something that they, were not, that they weren't comfortable with, and as a result, more people came to know the Lord. If you are a Gentile, thank Cornelius. Because he feared God and he wanted his family changed. All of us can walk this thing out. Again, there's more that you could plow through. I would just say, do it. Spend more time in the Word every day, you guys. I really believe the Lord's gonna show you more and more about who Christ is in your life. All right, guys, that's lesson 10, Acts 10. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks.